Let's pray. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations upon all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Judean city of Bethlehem is currently administered by the Palestinian Authority. It has been that way since 1995 under the Oslo Accords. Jews are currently not allowed in the city, but right outside there are Israeli checkpoints. Those soldiers outside of Bethlehem are prepared to shut down the city completely if there is any perceived problem. Over the years, Bethlehem has seen its share of war and conflict. This village has passed from one power to another. Before the Palestinian Authority, it was the state of Israel. Before Israel, it was Jordan. Before Jordan, it was the British. Before the British, it was the Ottomans. Before the Ottomans, it was the Egyptians. Before the Egyptians, it was the Crusaders. Before the Crusaders, it was the Syrians. Before the Syrians, it was the Byzantine Empire. Before the Byzantines, it was the Samaritans. And before the Samaritans, it was the Roman Empire. And that just gets us to the time of Christ. Most of the people of Bethlehem are just trying to work, trying to raise their families, to practice their faith, and to survive. It has not been easy over the years. In today's scripture lesson, the people of Bethlehem are under siege. The Philistines, that perennial problem of the Jewish people, have taken the city and have set up a garrison. Now, the last time we met David, he was a shepherd boy from that village of Bethlehem, and things were a whole lot better back then. Uh, there was something of an innocence, but conflict was never far from the surface. If you remember, the people of Israel were tired of the chaos, of the divisions and the problems. From the beginning, they were in the conflict with their neighbors, and there was division among themselves. They wanted to set things straight. And they had hoped that a king would get things right. And God responded, as we mentioned last week. God said, you're not going to like it with a king. A king will take advantage of his people. A king will use the resources of the people to enrich himself. A king will treat you like slaves. And the people said, yeah, we still want a king. So God gave them a king. That king was Saul. Now, Saul was a handsome guy, tall and strong, and things started out okay. But soon, the problems that God had pointed out, the things that he predicted, started to happen. Saul no longer served the Lord. He became paranoid and vindictive. And last week, we spoke about how the prophet Samuel came and anointed David as the new king. A king is supposed to be humble and obedient. He must serve God and his people, not simply himself. And David, this shepherd boy, was declared the new king. Now, the only problem about being declared a king for David was that there was already a king on the throne. Saul wasn't going to go willingly. But to be fair to David, he didn't press the issue. David always saw saw Saul, King Saul, as God's anointed. He figured that God in his own time would make him king. Now, in fact, David actually took a job in the court of Saul. He was a musician. He was a warrior in Saul's armies. But every time that David was successful... King Saul became enraged. He became jealous. And that jealousy made David and his men outlaws. So now the kingdom of Israel is in the midst of an existential crisis. From without, Israel's enemies are pressing in. The Philistines are taking cities like Bethlehem. And from within, the the kingdom was at war with itself. David was reduced to hiding in caves with his men. It's not surprising that David would become a bit nostalgic. He makes an offhand remark to his men. Oh, I would love to have a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. 
Perhaps David remembered as a boy stopping at that well before going out to watch his father's flocks. Perhaps David remembered the hustle and bustle of the townspeople gathered around that well. How sweet the water tasted when gathered with friends and family in good times. Now you can actually visit the well today in Bethlehem. Really it's a group of three cisterns that sits currently near a a Roman Catholic church. It's not the center of life that it once was, but the old men still gather there on occasion to tell stories and to laugh. Three of the men who overhear David that day were Joshab Bashabeth, say that three times real fast, Eleazar and Shema. Now these are really tough guys. Joshab Bashabeth is the leader of the three. He is credited for killing 800 men armed only with a spear in a single encounter. Eleazar and Shema are described in separate situations of facing down their enemies when everybody else ran. Think of the special forces like the Navy SEALs, the Army Rangers, or the Recon Marines, or the, or the Green Berets, okay? This is, who, this is who these guys are. They're the best of the best. And when they hear their king, when they hear their king say, I would love to have a drink of water from the well at Bethlehem, they hatch a plan. They decide that they're going to go and get, a, get their leader a drink from that well. Now, the plan is left to the imagination, though I'd love to see a Hollywood movie based upon it. Did it involve sneaking into Bethlehem under the cover of darkness? Did they make a frontal assault against the Philistine forces? Did they face unforeseen difficulty as they made their way to the well or, or maybe on the way back as they were leaving? We don't know. The Bible is silent on the matter, but nonetheless, they clearly risk their lives against overwhelming odds, all for a drink of water. Three men against an entire garrison of Philistines. If the Philistines had caught them, they would be dead. But Philistines didn't catch him. In fact, the three guys were were successful and they were able to bring their commander a drink. And David is overwhelmed. He sees this for what it is. It's not about water. This is about an outpouring of love of his men for their commander. His men love him with a deep devotion and they are willing to die for his comfort and care. What was it that Jesus said? No one has greater love than this, than to be, to lay down one's life for one's friends, right? Colonel John Masseur tells a story from the days of the Vietnam War. According to Masseur, mortar rounds fell on an orphanage in Vietnam, killing the missionaries and two of the children that were there. Several of the others were injured, including an eight-year-old girl. Desperate, the people of the village reached out to the Americans to come and care for the wounded. And an American Navy doctor, nurse, finally arrived with medical kits in hand. And they decided that the eight-year-old girl was the most in need of attention. She had lost a lot of blood and she was going into shock. Without a transfusion, she would surely die. The nurse and the doctor did not have the appropriate blood type, but they discovered that many of the uninjured children did. The doctor knew a few words of Vietnamese. The nurse knew some high school French. And they explained in the simplest terms in sign language that they needed a volunteer to give blood. After a long time, a little boy named Heng raised his hand. They put him on a pallet and they stuck in the needle. And the little boy began to shudder and to sob. The little boy then even stuck his fist in his mouth to stop his crying. 
The nurse and the doctor had no idea what was going on. They couldn't understand why this little boy was becoming so upset. Soon a Vietnamese nurse arrived. She saw the boy in distress, began to speak to him, comfort him, assure him. And after a moment, the little boy's face brightened. The sobs stopped. Glancing up, the nurse said quietly to the Americans, he thought he was dying. He misunderstood you. He thought that you had asked him to give all of his blood so that the little girl could live. But why would he be willing to do that? Asked the army nurse. The Vietnamese nurse repeated the question to the little boy who answered simply, she's my friend. The apostle Paul tells us indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. Paul notes this because the love that God has for us is greater than even that David's men have for their commander. Paul continues, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from the wrath of God. When we speak, at the manger at at Christmas time, we should also speak of the cross. I love David's illustration, it fits perfectly right here. The sense that the manger itself is a sign of that sacrifice that God made for us in Jesus. Jesus poured out his life for us even when we were unlovable. If we were honest with ourselves, we would know that we have failed to live as God would want us. We have hurt people. We have treated people with callous disregard. Yet God still loves us. God's love became a human being in Jesus Christ, and that human being gave everything for us, sacrificed everything for us. Christ humbled himself by being born among the animals in Bethlehem. Then he humbled himself again to be baptized with sinners. He then humbled himself. He spent time with prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. This was his ministry. And then ultimately... Jesus humbled himself by being crucified as a criminal on a cross. By suffering, by sacrificing, by being made low, Jesus Christ reaches down to lift us up. Now David, receiving this this sip of water from the well at Bethlehem, he is so moved by his men's sacrifice that he takes it and he pours it out. Now, when I read that story for the very first time, I thought, that's crazy. What kind of king would do that? I mean, after after all, these men have sacrificed everything, gone through all sorts of things to be able to, to get him this glass of water, and he just pours it out. But you have to understand the context. What David is doing is not just simply pouring out the water. It is, a, it is a sacrifice to God. What basically David is announcing to his men that this, what you have gotten to me, what you brought to me, what you worked so hard to that you were willing to sacrifice everything for, it's not worthy of me. This is only worthy of God. And he pours it out and gives I can't drink what you've done. It'd be like drinking your blood. I have to give this to where it, where it belongs. I gotta give this to the one who really deserves this. This is God's. So he gives the water to God. And David here shows himself as a king should be with humility and faithfulness. And by doing that, No longer is the bond between David and his band of brothers, it also includes God. Now we could learn something from David here. Relationships can be deepened or strengthened by our relationship with God. 
We are connected to each other by emotions, by shared experiences, or even by a common purpose. However, when we invite God into the relationship, it's transformed. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we find a curious passage of scripture. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now that passage is often read at weddings. And every time I've shared that at a wedding, people come to me and say, well, wait a minute, I thought you were talking about two, and now you're talking about a cord of three? What's the extra cord there coming from? I mean, I get it, you know, two people, and then where's the third? I hope that that third cord in our marriages is God. Invite God into your marriages, into your friendships, into your families. Even invite God into your business partnerships. When you gather together, acknowledge God's presence. Seek his will for your life and for your relationships. Lean on God and not on your own understanding. The Christmas season involves a lot of preparation. There are presents to be bought and wrapped. There are decorations to be displayed. There are cookies to be baked. There are trips to visit family. There are programs at school and at church. However, have you invited Christ into this celebration? Like the Christmas carol we sang a little bit ago, let every heart prepare him room. We should invite Jesus into this celebration. Otherwise, we're simply spinning our wheels. Make this season about the love of God that was made real to you and me. There's a notable postscript to the story of David and his men. Later in this particular chapter of scripture, there's a listing of David's men, the guys who were the most loyal, most prominent with David. Strong, loyal, powerful men, willing to sacrifice everything for their king. You want a drink of water, sir? We'll go to hell and back for you, sir. The last one on the list was a man named Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was the husband of a lady named Bathsheba. David had Uriah killed and took Bathsheba as his own wife. Why? Because he could. Now David was considered a man after God's own heart. He was humble and faithful as king, except when he wasn't. Here were his men who sacrificed everything for him and yet he took the sacrifice that was given and made it profane. He abused his position. Likewise, we've been given the loyalty and sacrifice of our Savior. He has loved us beyond all of our abilities. This Christmas season, welcome the Christ child into your hearts. Let's prepare a room. Amen.